this is Rebecca's first time to preach. Yeah. Yeah. So, So the first thing I just want to look at is immediately 
the beginning. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. And I think uh, James mentioned this again a couple of weeks ago, how the disciples would have they would have known the waters. They were fishermen. They would have known what was going to happen. They would have probably seen, I don't know, the clouds and a bit of wind, and they would have known that a storm was coming, and Jesus made them. So from the beginning, Jesus already knew what was going to happen. So the first encouragement, Jesus knows what you're going through. He knows what's going to come. He knows and he's there. The second thing I want to look at is that word buffeted. So they were on this boat and they were buffeted by the winds and the waves. So the word buffeted also means pushed against. It means struck repeatedly and rapidly. So this is what was happening in the boat. It means knocked off course. So, and let me just relate it to just things um, in our own life. There's times where we feel like we're being pushed against. You know, we feel like we're being buffeted by the wind and the storm. And we feel like we're being pushed against constantly. But it says in verse 25, <clears throat> it's read, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Jesus was right there with them. Jesus is with you as you feel buffeted by the wind and the storm. He is with you and he will never leave you or forsake you. So let's look at some promises. Amen. So if you want to turn to it, write down in Deuteronomy 31, chapter 31, verse 8. It says, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Amen. He goes before you. He knows you're not alone in your trial. Be encouraged this morning. Be reminded again, you are not alone. He's with you. He's there to comfort you, to guide you. He knows what you're going through. And this, this should give you a boost of confidence. I know it does for me. When I feel like someone's alongside me, um, someone's helping me or knows what I'm going through. It does give you that boost of confidence, knowing that they're praying for you and they're supporting you. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 27, 10 says, When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Sometimes we feel like we're very alone. We feel like we're alone in what we're going through, whatever that might be. But it says that when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. So even when we feel like we're alone and there's no one there alongside us and we feel like no one knows what we're going through, then the Lord says he will take care of you. He will take you under his wing and he will take care of you. You are not alone. Amen. So let's keep going. In verse 26, it says, When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus is so reassuring here. He's always reassuring, always reminding us that we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to worry. He is with us. <clears throat> Verse um, 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter said. I don't know why he said if it's you. Jesus already said it's him, so if it's you, <laughs> tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. Now, a lot of us know this story and we look, I suppose, at the negative. You know, as we go on, we'll see that Peter, Peter sank, but he obeyed Jesus. You know, he actually was in obedience. Jesus said, come, and he came and he obeyed him. And we, when we obey Jesus and we obey his word and at his word, miracles happen, miraculous things happen. Peter here, he defined the natural laws of physics. So no one else is recorded in the Bible to have walked on water. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has walked on water in the past or, or will walk on water. But I know for me, when I was younger, I don't know, did anyone else ever try this? You go to like the swimming pool and you stand at the edge and you're like, yes, I can do this. I'm going to be like Peter. And you take a step and then you just fall I've, I've definitely tried that. There's a few things I've tried. I've also tried um, Samuel in the Bible. He, he heard a voice when he was, when he was young. And um, the third time he heard it, he said, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. I've definitely tried that as well. I think someone called me, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. <laughs> it's funny the things that are happening, especially as kids. Um, but I mean, Peter walked on water. So he did, he came and he listened to Jesus and um, he walked. So when Jesus speaks, miracles happen, amen? When Jesus speaks, the world changes. When Jesus speaks, waves calm, disease disappears, the blind can see, the paralyzed leap, sinners are forgiven. When Jesus speaks, lives are restored, the supernatural happens. That's when Jesus speaks. And what is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. Because in John 1, it says, in the beginning 
was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when we speak God's Word, things happen. That's how important God's Word is. And a metaphor, I suppose, when we speak God's Word, we walk on water. And that's exactly what Peter did. He was trusting in God's Word, um, and he was believing, and he, he walked on the water. But then, verse 30, <laughs> verse 30 says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. So when Peter saw what was going on around him, when he saw what was in the natural, that's when he began to sink. And it says slowly. So I believe that fear began to creep in, looking around, it says he was afraid. Um, he started to see what was happening. He probably thought, my goodness, how, how am I doing this? And he took his eyes off of Jesus, taking his eyes off of the word, what Jesus is, um, and he began to sink. And that is not what God wants for us. You know, fear is not from God. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So giving into fear is not what God has for you. It swallows you up. It causes us to sink. And that is not what God wants for us. And, you know, with fear, doubt often comes as well. So doubt, the word doubt, in other, other words for doubt, is uncertainty, questioning, suspicion, wavering, lack of trust, lack of confidence. And with this doubt, this can actually often hinder the manifestation of God's promise for us. And you know, no one's immune to doubt. We're not like immune to it, we're not like superheroes, but we need to know how to handle it when it comes in. We need to know how to handle when doubt comes um, and when fear comes. And to overcome doubt and overcome fear, and to place our faith in the word of God and depend on that more than depending on what we see around us. So it's not allowing our five senses to dominate our thinking. You know, we need to allow God's word to be actually more real, the supernatural to be more real than what's actually going on um, around us, what we see, what we taste, what we hear, smell, um, and fear. So when we fear and doubt, it's so important to go back to God's word. And God's will for Peter was to walk on water. I don't believe it was Jesus' will for Peter to sink. I mean, I don't know how far he would have walked, maybe right up to Jesus and back, I don't know, but it was not God, Jesus' will for him to for him to sink. And it was the fear that caused Peter um, to sink. The fear hindered him. It hindered him from fulfilling what Jesus had planned. Um, so you can see what happens when we take our eyes off Jesus, when we take our eyes off the word and we take our eyes off the promise. We begin to question God at times, and us, me too, not to like all of us, me too, to question God, we lose trust and we lose our confidence in what God says. So let's look at some promises again. In Matthew 21, 21, Matthew 20 says, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive what you ask in prayer. Amen? So faith and doubt can exist sometimes together. Because, for example, in Matthew 9, a father came, Matthew um, chapter 9, a father came um, with his sick son, and um, just a short kind of version, Jesus said, believe, and he said to Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. So it's so important to get rid of this step. Jesus said, faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. So it's getting rid of the doubt that's mixed in there by keeping our eyes on the promise and God's word and meditating on the word. So I just want to give a little, maybe a little um, example in my own life. So when I was pregnant with Amara, I was about five months pregnant and I went for the anomaly scan. So anomaly scan is about five months and basically they measure the baby, they look at the everything. They look at the blood flow, they look at the brain and everything. And um, I actually was on my own that day. Michael had some exams, so I was on my own. So the nurse um, looked at everything and she says, oh, I'm a bit concerned. Um, um, the baby has lumps on her brain. So she said, these lumps are cysts. 
And I was like, okay. So she said, yeah, she wanted to refer me to the hospital in Dublin, so the Dublin Maternity Hospital. Um, and I came out shocked. I mean, I really did. I was like, wait, what? And I'm not going to lie, I really did fear that, feel that fear creep in and that doubt and that, oh my goodness, because we, we really were standing on God's word. They're going to have a healthy pregnancy, a healthy baby. Um, and yeah, it was just a shock. So I, I definitely felt that fear. Like I said, we're not immune to it. It definitely does. But I think it's it's what do we do then? Do we stay in that or do we, do we turn to the word? So I went back to the word. I went back to God and I just said, God, okay, what do you say? And in Psalm 121, that's where he brought me to. And it says, Psalm 121 verse 5, it says, The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. And praise God. Well, as I stood on that word and I just believed and I was quoting it so much and so much, we went for another few more scans. And praise God, the scan showed just the cysts had totally disappeared and they're completely gone. So praise God. What a miracle. Absolutely fine. Um, so then, Amara was born, and then I felt fear creeping in again. So as a as a new mother, you have this little tiny baby, and you're like, oh my goodness, the world is so big. I can't protect her. I can't, you know. And I really, really felt myself like, how how do I do this? I can't I can't keep her safe from everything. I just can't. What about when she's in school? What about when she's sleeping? What if she doesn't eat properly? All of this, all the ifs. So sorry, coming into my mind. And again, I really felt the Holy Spirit bringing me back to Psalm 121. And what I started to do, I actually started to add Amara's name into the verse. So for example, the Lord watches over Amara. The Lord is her shade at her right hand. The sun will not harm Amara by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep Amara from all harm. He will watch over her life. The Lord will watch over Amara's coming and going, both now and forever more so praise God and I'll be honest I still have to quote that at times I still need to stand on that word because it is it can be kind of you know the world is so big and our kids are growing up the world and the day and age that we're in you know there's so much out there and as parents now that I know I'm a parent you can't actually protect protect them from everything um you just release them to God and trust God's word amen so let's look at more promises in Isaiah 41 verse 10 it says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will keep you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. Let's look at another one. Joshua 1, 9 says, have I not commanded of you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So I encourage you this morning, if you're writing down these promises, if you're struggling with fear, take these verses, quote the word of God, speak it out, and just watch that fear disappear. Amen. So let's keep going. Verse 31 of Matthew 14, verse 31. So immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And there's a full stop. So praise God. Even when we feel like we're sinking or we might miss it, Jesus is right there. God is right there with his hand out saying, my child, my daughter, my son, you are mine and he will catch you and he will not leave you. He says, you have little faith, he said. Why did, we, why did you doubt? So we know why, I suppose, Peter doubted. He took his eyes off of Jesus, took his eyes off of the word, off of the promise, um, and even through all that, Jesus stretched out his hand and he saved, saved Peter. So we can learn from this. So let's look at more promises. In Psalm 46, verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, amen, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. And I just jumped to verse 11. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. 
Amen. Psalm 91, 15 says, He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. So you have many promises there that we can just go over um, to counteract fear and counteract doubt. Amen. Now let's go to my second um, second uh, passage that I want to look at, and that's in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So you can turn to that if you like. 1 Samuel chapter 30. So I'm just, I mean, it's a long enough chapter. You can read it all yourselves, but I'm just going to go to verse 8. So 1, 1 to 8. So 1 Samuel 30, it says, David and his men reached Zillag, this is King David, on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Zillag. They had attacked Zillag and burned it and taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Zillag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had also been captured. Verse 6, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Verse 7, then David said to the priest, bring me the ephod. Ephod was like a, like a cloak that they would, or like a, some sort of gown that they would wear um, when they wanted to speak, speak to the Lord. So verse 8, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, God said, you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. Amen. So let's go back and just just look at this again. So David was human. So what happened? Yeah, he was human. He was the king and he had come back from his camp and he found that it was raided. Everything had been taken. Um, Wives, children, um, everything, all their livestock, everything had been taken. The enemy had come in. Now they'd killed no one, but they just took them as captive. And um, David and his men found it just completely destroyed. So verse four, so it says, David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength to weep. So David, David was grieved. I mean, this had happened. The enemy had come in and had taken all that he had. So it's, it's, it's natural to be upset when things happen. It's natural to grieve. It's natural to cry. It's, we're human, you know? And it says in verse five that David was Sorry, it says in verse 6 that David was greatly distressed because now the men that he trusted wanted to kill him. I mean, come on, like, it's not his fault, like, you know, but they wanted to, I mean, it's, it's, it's human nature to blame someone, you know, for our problems and th- things that happen. So they wanted to, wanted to blame David, they wanted to kill him, so he was greatly distressed. This word, distressed. And I looked it up just to see exactly what it meant. It means suffering from extreme anxiety, sorrow, or pain. Other words for distress is anguish, miserable, tormented, disturbed, heartbroken, gut-wrenching. And it says that David was greatly distressed. So not even just distressed, but he was greatly suffering from extreme anxiety and sorrow. But even in David's distress, what did he do? I want to bring out three points here, the three points that <clears throat> look and see what David, David did. The first one, David made a choice in that moment. So everything had been taken. He was distressed. He was hurt. It was gut-wrenching. He was in anguish, and he made the, dis- made, the, made the choice. Am I going to look at what's happening around me and what the enemy has, has taken, or am I going to look at someone higher than it all? Am I going to look to something else? And David chose good. Because the second point in that verse, verse 6, it says, David found strength in the Lord his God. Other versions say he strengthened himself in the Lord. So what does that look like? Well, I mean, he took his eyes off himself, off of what's going on, and he put it on the Lord. He took 
he took his eyes and he took it to the word of God and he began to encourage himself. Situations in life bring discouragement, you know, and that's where the enemy wants you to stay. He wants you to stay in discouragement, stay in distress, stay in anxiety. <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily normal to be encouraged when we go through hard things. It's actually quite abnormal, you know, to say I'm strong and courageous when we're going through something. But it is doable because it's supernatural and it's doable because of God's word. In Isaiah 26, it says, you will keep him, Isaiah 26, 3, it says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. So because David did this, because he took the word of God, I mean, maybe he reminded himself of what God had done in his life. He might have reminded himself of past um, past victories that he had, and remind. I know, I know times in my life when I remind myself of what God has done in the past, that's really encouraging, and think, wow, God, you were with me here, you've given me a word for this situation, so I can trust you now to be with me in this situation. So in that moment, David finds strength and encouragement. And the third point I want to bring out, in verse 8, it says, David inquired of the Lord. As my dad would often say, go to the throne and not the phone. So he went straight to God. He inquired of the Lord. This word inquired means to ask someone or to look to someone else for answers. So David looked to the Lord for an answer for his problem. He looked to God for the promise to overcome. And God answered him and he stood on that word. And you know, I just want to look at it. Um, there's a word um, called a rhema word. So rhema is a Greek word spelled R-H-E-M-A. And a rhema word basically means God's word spoken to you or a spoken word of God for you now or God's word spoken at a specific time for a purpose. So that's a rhema word. So we can nearly look at this as an example of a rhema word. David asked the Lord, what do I do in this situation? And God was faithful and told him exactly what to do. And we see in verse 8, later on, it says, pursue them, God said. He answered, you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. And this was the promise that David was able to hold on to. This was the rhema word. So I just want to give an example of a rhema word, I suppose, um, in my own life. So I traveled a little bit um, when I finished college. I lived in Guernsey, Channel Island. It's one of those, it's like an island between England and France. Worked there for a few years. Um, I came back then, I traveled in Spain for a bit, and then came back to Kilkenny, and I wanted to stay here. I said, look, I want to look for a job. I want to get something more secure here. And... I'd been standing on the word Jeremiah 29, 11, so we all know, for God knows the plans he has for us, declares the Lord, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us hope and a future. So I knew that God had a job out there for me. I knew it. And I went through so many different interviews and I got rejected so many times. People might be able to relate. And it was very disheartening and I was like, okay, I'll keep going. God, I know you have a plan for me. I'm going to stand on that word. And then... A job came up in Loreto, in the secondary school that I actually went to, and it's an SNA job, special needs assistant. And um, I went for the job, and I, re I really wanted this job. So I asked, you know what? I inquired of the Lord. I said, okay, God, what do you say about this? Like, I want to hope for it, but I'm kind of like, if it's not of you, okay. And I asked him, God, I want to ream a word. I want a word specifically for this situation, specifically for this time for me. And he answered me, and he brought me to Exodus 33, 17, which says, And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. And wow, that, that just hit my spirit. I mean, it was amazing. I was like, wow, that is so specific. I'm like, yes, Lord, okay. And for those of you who know, when you get a word like that, it really just drops into your spirit. And you know, you know, you know, you know, God has spoken to me, and I can stand on this word. I went for the job, and... Um, yeah, I got it, praise God, which is great. <laughs> but, ju but just before that, um, there was one evening that um, 
I was doing, I remember I was in my bedroom doing something and um, my mom came in and she said, oh, Rebecca, I've had a dream about you. Now, when my mom says she has a dream about me, I'm like, okay, is it good or bad? So this is what I had to grow up with. Every time my mom would say, I have a word for you, I'm like, oh no, Lord, have you told her now my deepest, darkest secrets? <laughs> this, this is what happens when you live with people that are prophetic. Um, but no, it was good. In this sense, it was good. And she said she had a dream and she felt the Holy Spirit say, this job I'm giving to her because she has been obedient. Now, I hadn't told my mom the word that I had got, and that was just so reassuring. Again, it was just God saying, I'm confirming to you, this is the word, and um, praise God, I got the job. And, and I knew, and I knew I hadn't got it from my own efforts. I knew that God was saying, I want to bless you and give you this because I love you. So that's just an example of a Rima word for a specific season and for a specific time. And we can all learn from David, you know. He made a choice here. He made, he made a choice that wasn't easy, especially in the middle of the trial. Um, and you know what? We have, we have someone that David didn't have. Actually, we have the person of the Holy Spirit. That is Jesus' promise that it's our comfort. he's our comforter, he's our guide, he's our helper. And when we yield to the Holy Spirit... He comes alongside us and he comforts us in our hour of need. And in 1 Corinthians 14.4, it says, He who speaks in tongues edifies himself. So in Jude 1, 20, it says, But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto you eternal life. So praying in the Holy Spirit, so praying in tongues also builds us up. Standing on God's word and obeying his word and praying in tongues. Praying in tongues bypasses, so praying in the spirit bypasses our minds and allows our spirits to be in communion with God without any hindrances. That's what praying in tongues does. And David didn't have, have that, but we do. We can pray in tongues and we can stand on God's word and we can find strength in the situations. Amen. So we can learn from this. And if we just jump to verse 18 of 1 Samuel 30, verse 18, it says, David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives, Verse 19, nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. Amen. So David had a promise to stand on that he would overtake them and succeed. And God's word came to pass. Amen. So I just feel as Christians, we do have two choices well, there's many choices, <laughs> but I just feel just for, for, for this message, two choices that through life's trials and hard situations um, we need to look at. So choice number one, will you choose to give into fear and let it consume you and give into the doubt, or will you trust God's word that says you do not need to fear because he is with you? So what are you going to choose? In Psalm 23, 4, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod to protect, and your staff to guide, they comfort me. He is your protector. He is your guide. I encourage you this morning. You do not need to fear. Do not fear. Amen. <laughs> There's a song called Fear is a Liar by Zach Williams. Some of you might be familiar with it. But the chorus goes, Fear is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear into the fire because fear is a liar. Fear brings doubt and anxiety and it hinders us. So make the good choice. Don't give in to the fear. Don't let it overtake you. Turn back to God's word. Stand on the promises of God. Psalm 56 says, 3 says, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? So if you're struggling with fear this morning, I just encourage you, 
take some of these promises that I've, I've put out, go to God's word, look at a verse that talks about fear and stand on that because that's what God has for you. He has not given you a spirit of fear. The second choice, will you give in to distress and discouragement because of, because of what's happening, which is very easy to give into, or will you look at the promise God has given you? I encourage you this morning, inquire of God, inquire of the Lord and ask him for that specific word for a situation. He's faithful to answer. He's faithful to give it to you for a word in season. And for every problem, there is a promise. And sometimes it might not come straight to mind. Sometimes our, our situations are quite specific. Um, and it, it might be hard to try find it in the word. But if you ask God, if you ask the Holy Spirit, he will give that to you. When you yield to the Holy Spirit and when you're in his word, he will give you something, a Rima word for this season that you can stand on and you, can over, you will overcome. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Amen. So two choices. Will you fear or will you not fear? Will you choose to trust God's word? And will you choose to ask him for that specific word for you when you feel like you're going through distress and discouragement? So choose a life this morning. Choose life. You have the victory. You are victorious in Christ. Amen. Everything you need in this life, Christ has given you. And there's just a song called The Blessing um, that I just want to speak over you. Um, and the, the bridge um, goes, may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. Amen. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming and in your going, in your weeping and in your rejoicing, he is for you. He is for you. Amen. Um, and just as the worship team come up, if that's okay, um, James, just to strum slowly in the background. Um, I just want to pray. And I just really feel something on my heart as well. And um, I just re really feel that the Spirit of the Lord, he just wants to work in the area of healing this morning. I really just sense it in my spirit. So if you have any form of healing that you need in your body, in your mind, I just really want to encourage you just to come up for prayer afterwards to so either our prayer team, um, to me, to, to one of the leaders, that we can just stand with you in prayer. Amen. So I just want to pray for us as well, just, just as I close. God, I just thank you so much for your word, Lord, and thank you that your word brings life, Father God, and just thank you for all that you are, Father Lord, and thank you that your word does not return void, that it goes forth to accomplish what it needs to, Father Lord, and I just thank you for the encouragement of your word, Father Lord, this morning, that we do not need to fear because you are with us, God. And every trial and situation that people are going through this morning, Lord, I just pray for just that fresh encouragement, Lord, to keep going, to keep on keeping on, Father Lord, that they can just turn to your word, Father God, and trust in you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that as your people ask of you this week, God. Ask for that ream of word, Father Lord, for their situation, God. I thank you that you are faithful to answer, Lord. That your will, Father Lord, is for deliverance and for healing, Father Lord. That's what you came, Jesus. You died on the cross so, so we would be free, God, that we can live this life in freedom and wholeness, Father Lord. You are good, God, and you're an awesome Lord. And we thank you, God, for your word. And God, I just pray for those struggling with sickness and disease and 
torment, Father God, distress, discouragement, whatever it is, Lord. God, I just want to I just want to declare your word over their situation, Lord, that they are victorious, God. That they do not need to fear, Lord, for you are with them. God, you have an answer for their problem. You have an answer for their situation, Lord. And I thank you, God, that your people will see healing and they will see victory, God, right now in this day and age, Father Lord. At this time, today, this week, this month, this year, Father Lord, that is your will and that is your plan, God. Because you are a good God. You are an awesome God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You are a God that heals, Father Lord. You are the healer. Thank you, God. Your word is true. Your word is real. Your word is life. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And we can use that to fight the enemy to pierce the enemy, to pierce sickness, to pierce disease, and we will see wholeness, and we will see life, and we will see deliverance and healing. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, Father Lord. Amen, God. Amen. Amen. So just as I said, for anyone that's just dealing with anything, distress or needs healing in their life please come forward let us just lay hands on you let us stand with you and just encourage you and I believe I believe you will see your healing I believe you will see the victory amen amen thank you amen